Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Smothers. Uh, I am an engineer. Sorry, I'm going to try to continue speaking into this mic. I'm an engineer working at Meta, uh, and I work on Torch Tune, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to go through. Uh, first, I'm just going to talk about the design of Torch Tune um, and why we chose to design things the way that we did. Uh, then I'll do a bit of a case study on memory efficiency, some of the different levers that we can pull. Uh, and then I'll talk about training speed, torch compiles, some other things. Uh, and then finally, we'll close out with long context, uh, larger models. OK, so let's talk about what goes into a fine tuning library. We want state of the art models. We want all our different training loops, SFT, uh, different RLHF loops, maybe quantization aware training, distillation, all, all this stuff, right? Uh, then there's PEFT, which uh, Daniel and Wing have talked about. Uh, maybe other memory efficiency techniques. Uh, sorry, I'm still getting used to this microphone. Um, and then finally, everything data set related, right? So and each of these is its own dimension that there's just a ton that you can explore. Uh, and this very, become, very quickly becomes like a combinatorial problem. Uh, I will talk about like the first four of these today. Data is kind of, uh, we'll leave that for a follow up. Um, OK, so people maybe heard about Torch 2 and in the keynote. Uh, what is it? So kind of two pieces. There's a library of modular components. Uh, so this could be like, yeah, pieces of a model architecture, uh, data sets, data abstractions, um, training utilities, things like that. Uh, and then we provide training recipes, which are supposed to be simple, hackable scripts uh, that you can easily copy and modify right from the command line. Uh, and the goal here is to like increase the speed of experimentation, make it really easy to just Take some model, uh, hack it a bit, uh, change something about the training loop, um, maybe change your config a little, and then try out some new technique. Uh, and then we also care a lot about memory efficiency. So a lot of what I'll go through today is single device, but we support training on up to a single node as well. OK, so going through the design a bit, uh, I'll fly through this a little bit. But the philosophy is really like we just want to overgeneralize our modeling components a little bit. So it might seem, oh, you're overengineering so much, stop doing this. That's fair. Um, so we have very general modeling components, model class, and then maybe like mid-level model components, very, very general. Um, the idea is that then we can actually just like write builder functions that will build instantiations of different models. Uh, and so really, we support, I don't know, Gemma, Llama, Mistral, dif different Llama models, Mistral, Quentu, et cetera. These are all just a single NN dot module. Like, it's all the same class. We just provide different builders. Uh, OK, why do we do this? Copy pasting. Uh, it's really, really easy to copy paste. If you want to add a new model, you just copy paste our builders for Llama or something similar, right? Uh, and then you change what you need to change. But the point is, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, and then it's also, it plays really nicely with uh, PEFT. I think I have an example here. So here, instead of an NN.linear, I just plug in like a Laura linear, uh, which has maybe the same signature or a similar signature. Uh, and then this is kind of like free to be configured however you want, right? Maybe you want to apply Laura to just uh, self-attention. Maybe you want to apply it to MLP. You can write your own builder. You can experiment with this really easily. And it's all just uh, accessible from the command line. Um, same principles for our training recipes. So we have a CLI. Uh, you can just run TuneCP to copy a recipe uh, and put it on a local path. Uh, or if you just have the repo checked out, obviously, you don't even need to do that. Um, Make some changes. So here we're looking at an example with quantization-aware training. So this is literally all you need to do to enable quantization-aware training in Torch Tune, assuming it doesn't exist already, which it does. Uh, so, but change five lines in the recipe after you copy it. Okay, copy some config from a full fine tune. Uh, add your QAT arguments to the config. Tune run with your local paths. That's it. You're good. Now you've done quantization-aware training. Great. Um, okay. So that's kind of some aspects of the design of Torch Tune. Let's just do a little case study on like different uh, memory efficiency levers that we can pull in the library. Um, so here, let's say we have a synthetic data set, context length 8K, batch size 2, and we're going to fine tune Llama 3 AB on an A100. A100 is not strictly necessary here, but it's just so that we can actually like start looking at profiles sooner without ooming. Um, and that's because we're just going to start by doing the dumb thing. So we're just going to full fine tune. Adam W, uh, BF16, but still, um, we don't have enough memory to do this. This takes more than 80 gigs. We can look at each of the individual components here. We have 
16 gigs weights, 16 gigs gradients, 32 in optimizer state, and then some number greater than 16 for activations. Uh, I'll hand wave that. Um, so the activation chunk was pretty big, so we can apply activation checkpointing, right? We just recompute them in the backward. Um, this still doesn't work. Uh, yeah, also hand waving how much is here in activations, to be honest. Um, okay, so the biggest chunk now is the optimizer states. So let's talk about that. Uh, another shout out to, uh, yeah, to bits and bytes. Um, here we're using their 8-bit Atom W. Uh, so yeah, we use a reduced precision optimizer. Uh, and now we're under 80 gigs, and I think we come in around, yeah, 58. I don't know if anyone can actually see that at the bottom, but that's the max memory. Um, so, yeah, we come in at 58 gigs, um, and, yeah, what do I want to say here? Right, so we save 16 gigs by, quanti or by reducing the precision of the optimizer state from 16-bit to 8-bit, and there's actually another uh, 8 gigs sitting around from specific things about uh, Torch's Atom W default that we were using but we'll set that aside. Um, okay, so this is uh, a memory profile that's uh, a great tool, by the way, from PyTorch, uh, and you can use this, uh, you can view it in the memory viz tool, um, and yeah, we expose it in Torch Tune through the CLI, so you can just add some config, and you can get these for free, and that's kind of the point of this section of the talk, actually, is to show, like, okay, I can't tell you how to make your model performant, but the point is you can do it yourself, right? You just add some config to the command line, you get your memory profile, uh, you can get your traces, which we'll look at later, uh, and you can figure it out yourself. So continuing with this example, we have some big spike here. Uh, this is two iterations, by the way, forward and backward. Uh, if people have looked at these before, they know, but just to like, yeah, go through that, like, there's a forward, big spike, backward, forward, big spike, backward. Okay, what's the big spike? Uh, I think probably Daniel kind of alluded to it before. It's the cross entropy loss, uh, so we need to do something about that. Um, so we can do, we can apply chunking uh, on the cross entropy loss, right? So one thing that's happening, uh, we're not just applying it to the cross entropy, we're also applying it to like the output projection, right? So there's actually like an upcast FP32 happening. So if we do this in chunks, we free the memory after each chunk and that saves us like a ton of memory. Um, and now we're down to like 48 gigs max, I think. Um, and yeah, we're actually not even changing anything. This is sort of by default in Torch 2, and I sort of cheated by showing the other ones. Like, this is how it would look to begin with, so. Um, okay, let me go back. So now the peak is actually, like, at the end of the backward here. Uh, it's just above the cross entropy. And so we can do some other things to, like, reduce the memory in backward. Uh, so we can fuse the optimizer step in the backward. Uh, and then we throw out the memory from the gradient uh, as we accumulate them, right? We take the step on each parameter uh, as we have the gradient available, uh, and that way we save memory on backward. And so now our peak is back to cross entropy. We actually didn't like save that much memory by doing this because that peak is similar. Um, okay, so let's take a side trip. This is all full fine tuning. A lot of people, if they actually care about memory efficiency, aren't going to be doing this. They're going to be doing LoRa, they're going to be doing QLoRa. Um, LoRa is great, save on gradient memory, save on optimizer memory. Uh, QLoRa, you can also save on uh, parameter memory. So let's go through the same exercise with LoRa. So TorchTune provides recipes for LoRa, uh, single device or distributed. Um, so we're keeping roughly the same config we had before without getting into details of like which layers LoRa is applied to, et cetera. Um, but you can see that we save like 15 gigs right off the bat just by applying LoRa. And we still have this nice cross entropy spike, um, which such is life. Um, but the bottom piece is quite large here. I think we have like 16 gigs or so that's just like sitting around all the time, right? And that's where QLoRa will help. So now we quantize the base weights. So this is an NF4, uh, and this saves us about 10 gigs, I think. Um, we still have the spike, and now it's really prominent, right? Because all of the weights uh, that we've saved memory on like are much, much smaller proportional to the cross entropy. Okay, so now I'm just going to hand wave. Compile, compile equals true, and we're great. Like, look how much memory we save. The cross entropy spike flattens out, uh, and we're now, I think we're, yeah, we're under 16 gigs uh, pretty comfortably, which is great. Um, yeah, I'm hand waving that because I'm going to talk about it in a second. Uh, so this is a good segue since we're talking about compile. Like, we're applying all these memory optimizations. Like, how do we actually know that we're not just grinding our training to a halt, right? Uh, it's a very plausible question, especially like talking about fusing optimizer and backward. We're 
we're doing a bunch of extra stuff and like maybe we're actually just slowing things down. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about Torch Compile uh, and how we can get good performance out of it. So our baseline here, let's look at tokens per second uh, coming in at like 2,500 and we were at maybe like 24 gigs, right? So we can fit on a 4090 just barely. Um, so one thing about the chunked cross entropy loss is that you can actually benefit a lot by compiling it uh, in a very particular way. Like you compile the upcast and you compile the cross entropy loss itself. You don't actually want to compile like the chunking. Uh, and if we do that, well wait a minute, our training slowed down. So that's not great, but we do save memory. So that's actually what was helping to flatten out the memory. Um, and you can see also like, I think compile time is important. Uh, it's about 25 seconds, so it's pretty reasonable here. So we want training to go faster, not slower when we're using Torch Compile. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can compile the entire model. We're just compiling the loss right now. So if we compile the model and loss, compile everything together, um, we save more memory, so now we're at 16 gigs, which is great, right? Uh, and our training sped up a lot, like 50% almost. Um, but it takes about four minutes to compile. Maybe we don't want that. Um, so our sweet spot, let's see. Our sweet spot is to compile per layer. So why is that? We get most of the perf benefits. Okay, so it's a little slower. Um, but Torch Compile will reuse uh, all of the artifacts that are compiled for each layer, right? So we're not redoing this every time. Uh, and we compile in under a minute. We get most of the perf benefits, no increase in memory. And so when I said I was hand waving, oh, compile equals true. Okay, well, I could get a lot more in depth on compile, like, uh, but I think I'm already like running out of time. So maybe we'll stop there. And I'll just say, in Torch Tune, set compile equals true, you'll get good performance and pretty fast compile time. Okay, and I'm also realizing I have like way too much content, so I will probably uh, do one more thing and then defer to the slides for the rest of it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, more performance on like a real data set. So a lot of data sets, maybe they have very short context length, maybe they have very long context, context length. Uh, if we have short context length, we want to use sample packing, right? It's very, very inefficient to just use the raw data and like pad to max sequence length in the batch. Uh, the problem is maybe you have like information leaking across samples if you do this. Uh, you can't just use like a naive causal mask. You need to use a block causal mask. So causal mask on the left, uh, right? I don't know. On my left is a causal mask. And then the other one is a block causal mask. Um, so the problem is previously you couldn't do this with PyTorch's uh, scaled dot product attention and flash attention. Uh, until dot, 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 oh, oh, oh. Uh, flex attention, right? So we onboarded flex attention into Torch Tune, and now you can create any custom mask you want uh, within reason um, and still get all the performance benefits of flash attention. So let's look at some numbers here, uh, and then I'll probably uh, skip through the last like 20 slides that I have in the interest of time. Uh, okay, so here, let's say, uh, we're using a real data set. We have 52,000 samples, roughly 10 million tokens. We're running QLORA on a single device, a uh, single A100 with batch size two. And if we just kind of do the naive thing, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with like open source fine tuning data sets, you can probably infer which data set this is. Um, I'll leave it at that. So our baseline here takes like six hours to train. This is no compiled, no optimizations, nothing like that. It's very slow. Um, QLORA takes longer than LORA, right, because we have to upcast from NF4 to, to BF16 as well, so that's something. Um, okay, let's say we just apply compile. We already get like a huge, huge performance win out of the box. And when I say end-to-end -end training time, I'm including compile time, which as we saw previously is actually pretty minor anyways. Um, yeah, tokens per second goes way up. No real impact to memory. Okay, but I was talking about sample packing, flex attention. So if we do that, even without compile, we're already getting better performance. We can train full epoch in 90 minutes, um, but wait, there's more. Okay, so we, so we can increase the sequence length as well, uh, assuming that we have enough memory to do it, but even in this case, we're under 24 gigs, so if you have a 4090, you're still good to do this, right? Um, so packing, flex attention, sequence length 8,000, uh, just about an hour, okay? But we can also compile, right? So if we add compile to packing and flex attention, now we're down to 50 minutes, uh, and since we're back down to sequence like 2K, okay, we save a bunch of memory, so we're at eight gigs again. Okay, not done yet. Okay, so one more. If we go back up to 8K sequence length, now we're down to like 45 minutes, and we're almost 4,000 tokens per second. And just one thing I wanna call out here too, uh, this is like a nitpick that always annoys me. A lot of places they log tokens per second, like they count padding tokens, which I don't think anyone practically cares about. Uh, 
So this is not including padding tokens. Uh, yeah, if you include padding tokens, it actually kind of makes like sample packing look like it performs worse when in reality it doesn't. I think people should only care about unpadded tokens. Okay, that's my rant. Uh, but finally, we're still under 16 gigs. So let's say we have a beefier GPU. Let's cheat a little bit and let's just, we've had activation checkpointing on this whole time. Let's turn it off. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. So now we can train the whole epic 36 minutes, over 5,000 tokens a second, and we still come in under 40 gigs, which is great. Um, so the rest of the talk is focused on longer context. Uh, so this is kind of like the short context length case, uh, but there are other techniques for longer context length, like offloading the activations uh, and doing it in a separate stream. This is great work by uh, Jane from PyTorch. Uh, she's giving a talk tomorrow, highly recommend. Um, I will skip over all of that and go straight to uh, any QR codes if anyone is interested. Uh, yeah, that's it, thank you.